And thank you for, uh, for being invited to talk today on a project that isn't necessarily about foreign language study or uh, methodologies for studying language, but more on the DH side, I think. And uh, it's been inspiring here to come back and listen to Guy talk about the continued existence of Dante World. It was one of the first projects that I became a part of uh, a long time ago at UT, back in not, not maybe 10 years ago even. Yeah, I walked into Guy's office like, what are you working on? Uh, become Dante World. Uh, and it's interesting to have this presentation today after hearing about uh, digital pedagogy and digital humanities work related to Virgil and Dante. Uh, in many ways, when I think about digital humanities and the work of digital humanists, uh, the word humanist is something that we use quite a bit in still talking about the work of the digital humanities as, you know, I think about Pet Petrarch in some ways, you know, finding lost texts. What does that do to the way that we understand history? How does that reconfigure the way that we understand the value of history and the work of history. And in many ways, the story I'm going to tell you today is a story. Uh, it's something that isn't generated from my own field of interest or academic uh, expertise, which is really European Romanticism, uh, the work of memory and amnesia in many ways in texts and romantic literature. But it's uh, from interactions that I had with friends and colleagues, students uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee when I was starting up our digital humanities lab. Uh, so this is a this is a project that uh, is a story that I still am somewhat humbled by and being a part of because it's uh, the the way that the story grew and generated and the project uh, took shape was truly one where we were where people from multiple disciplines and multiple uh, backgrounds and areas of expertise whether that was academic or technical came together to design something that was truly collaborative and I have to tell you something when you think about collaborative uh, and interdisciplinary work. Uh, it's something where you bring something to the table and it can be somewhat terrifying <laughs> to work in a, in, a, in a kind of project world in which you're not really completely in control over the end product. I mean, you're contributing something, but maybe you're working with somebody from a different field or you're working some, with somebody from printmaking or from uh, instructional technology. And they're going to tell you something about how they're interpreting a story or a text that you're talking about that's completely different than what you are aware of in terms of your own background and expertise. So there's something incredibly creative, uh, humbling about this kind of work when, you, when it's truly collaborative in many ways. And this story that I'm going to tell you today about this project, I think, still uh, is very haunting to me in the way that it continues to live. So enacting digital public history for us uh, meant with beginning with this project in the Digital Humanities Lab at Wisconsin-Milwaukee, uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So when we started the lab, it was in the libraries in the digital, uh, in, at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. We were given space to uh, begin this kind of lab. Very little funding, meaning no funding. <laughs> right, digital Humanities it usually starts in a basement. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a famous blog post that's about tales from the basement. You know, this is where digital humanities labs begin. Ours, we were given space by uh, the director of the library. I said, well, here's a, here's a space that you can use. It was in the second floor, beautiful space, windows out looking over the fountain in the central quad of, of the university. And we thought, this is amazing. You know, what are we going to do here? So uh, we started to network and find folks who may be interested in doing this kind of work with us. And my own area, again, of interest had to do with memory studies and romantic, post-romantic literature. Uh, and a colleague, a friend of mine from Jewish and uh, Hebrew studies at, uh, at the university was aware of a new f uh, set of materials that had been discovered in the basement in some ways in, uh, in the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee. Uh, and she was approached to do something to contribute to the introduction to uh, the exhibit that the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee was going to put on. And she, uh, who, and I'll go back here, you'll notice here, there's a long list of people that are associated with this project. Rachel Baum, Rachel Baum was my colleague. And she said, well, I think it'd be interesting to not only do something to contribute to this project in the physical location, but I think we should do something that's digital, too. And I hear that digital humanities, you guys do that kind of stuff. And I said, yeah, that's true. We, uh, we have some tools at our disposal that are uh, open source, that are free, that we can help you design, perhaps some engaging way of looking at some of these materials that have been discovered uh, by the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee, who very generously gave us uh, a bit of funding to begin this project. So we said, well, what are we, what are we actually looking at? Uh, so Rachel brought us to the museum, uh, me and some of the interns in the, in the DH lab and the, uh, my library colleague, who was a co-director, Ann Hanlon, in digital collections. And 
showed us this letter uh, found in a Milwaukee basement in 1997. And it was a letter that was written uh, from a relative of somebody who lived in Milwaukee, Alvin Stranod, and his brother, Paul Stranod, uh, at the time was living in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and this letter is dated, you can't really read it, the small text up there, it's 1939. Uh, we all know perhaps what this period of history in this particular country, uh, what was happening uh, at the time. So Paul wrote to his brother Alvin saying that the situation is getting much worse here. Uh, based on what's happening with Germany. Um, and we need to find a way, if we can, to leave the country. And so in order to do that, uh, Paul had sent to his brother Alvin this letter, and enclosed with that letter were several drawings. And these drawings were of dresses. And what, and this is, some, this, <laughs> this is an amazing story. So Paul sent these de designs for dresses to his brother Alvin saying, I hope that we could leave the country because you can find us work in Milwaukee, uh, especially for my wife, Hedwig, also known as Hedy Stranod, and uh, maybe she could become a dressmaker because she has this ability, you know, she has this background to do this kind of work. She's been doing it for many years. Uh, so this was the picture that was accompanying this letter. So you see here, this is Paul Stranod on the right with his wife, and that's Hedy on the left. And so we looked at these materials initially, these letters, these dress designs in the photograph, and we said, well, we could probably do something with these, you know, to help extend the, uh, the appeal of coming to this exhibit in a small museum uh, in Milwaukee. So we said, well, there's a, there's a wonderful tool that we can use. It's free, it's easy to use. We want to help tell this story. We want to help put this material out there in order to tell this story. Uh, the, the tool that we used was called, is called Omeka. Has everybody heard of Omeka at Digital Humanities World? It's a well-known tool designed by academics at George Mason University uh, and the Center for New Media Studies. So we said, well, we'll use Omeka. We'll start bringing some students together uh, in Rachel's class. We'll take a look at these materials. We'll decide how we're going to archive them, put them online in Omeka. You know, we weren't sure what had happened to Hedy Stranod. We weren't sure what happened to Paul. So Rachel put an inquiry into, uh, into Yad Vashem, finding out what happened to her. And we found out in the process, the page of testimony that uh, Hetty was, in fact, along with Paul, killed during the Holocaust. And we discovered through this inquiry into where she was from, uh, we found out where she was from and where she, w where she would lost her life. Uh, it was in Auschwitz or Treblinka. But we found in this page also uh, where she was potentially living, what village she was living in. Right? So first we started this project again, you know, just going to the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee, looking at some archival materials, making an inquiry, and it's like, okay, let's find out some historical background of who this person is, right? And we received this. Now, from this slide to the next slide, a lot of things had happened. Uh, the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee became more interested. We, became we began talking with them more. Students were making visits to the museum in the class. Graduate students were beginning to become involved in thinking about digital humanities work as a project they would like to be a part of. So, what happened, and uh, the story has many miraculous turns in many ways. Uh, uh, an intern in the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee was a student in, one of, in Rachel's class. And over the summer, he was going to be going to Germany for a study abroad experience. And he was so obsessed with this story that we were putting together that he went to the village where Hetty was from, listed in the page of testimony, and tirelessly s sought out any information he could uh, and this is where the foreign language component comes in. He spoke German. <laughs> so he was, he was able to do this. Uh, and he found, you know, he found Hetty's niece living in a village because he was going around asking questions at local uh, establishments, local museums. And we found Brigitte Rorsek, who was the, uh, the niece of, Hed of Hetty's, uh, of Hetty, for the brother of her husband. So we found this letter that was from Paul to his brother-in-law and gave us more information about what happened. And in sending this letter back, the intern you know, translated it for us. And this is from an email. And we started to share this email around a little bit more within the local Milwaukee community, Jewish community. Uh, and more information started to emerge. We started to share this very broadly. And comments started to pile up on the side about who she was and where she was from. 
So what began initially in a digital humanities project was that a, a small box of materials we were going to share online has suddenly become something of a mystery story. Who is this person? Where is she from? What happened to her? Students who were a part of this project became more and more interested in as we went along because it felt as if what we were exploring and trying to discover was something that had never been put together before. It wasn't as if we were merely representing a story digitally, but that alongside the recreation of this person's life was a digital archive that was going to somehow contribute to the telling of this story for the very first time. And we found, finally, in, uh, in a wedding album that somebody brought forward who, was, who heard about this story in Milwaukee. This is how, this is, what, this is what I'm thinking about the humanistic side of things. Like it's just found texts that people are bringing forth from their basement from family materials, from background, right? This letter, Dear Alvin, this is from Paul Strenaud. Uh, miraculously enough, right? It was from uh, a relative. It says, uh, Dear Alvin, this is from 1938. So it was a little bit earlier than the original letter. I'm very sorry uh, to not be able to send along to you Czechoslovakian stamps. That we found, as a matter of fact, that the stamp on the initial letter, because the envelope was also saved, had stamps from Czechoslovakia. He was looking for more stamps to be able to send letters out of the country. Uh, he recounts what's happening. So we were like, well, how, in fact, did Hetty and Paul end up either Treblinka or Auschwitz? You will, of course, have, this is the second paragraph, you will, of course, have read in the press what a catastrophe has overtaken our country, a catastrophe which has upset our whole life, which formerly ran so smoothly. Politically uh, deserted by its allies, our republic was compelled to help the course uh, an all too great a loss by itself by giving up a great part of its territory to Germany. So Alvin goes on to hear from Paul what's happening to them, you know, and a recounting of the story of what's happening to their family, what they've lost, and their country. He's lost his three houses they've had to leave behind. So again, we're starting to see what's happening in somebody's individual life by this begin this exploration into where where these materials are coming from. You know, and it's very fortunate in many ways uh, that we were <laughs> that this all came together in the way that it did. But in talking about the digital humanities and its ability to transform the way or to energize the way that we talk about humanistic inquiry, the best way that we proceeded to build up this story about Hedy Stranod, the dressmaker, was thinking about the responsibility that we share for carrying stories forward, the work of history, whether that's public history or private history, and the role that memory plays in constructing the histories that we share and are a part of. We began to talk to students in the classroom, undergraduate students and graduate students began to, began to come to this class uh, in Rachel's uh, this semester and we were talking about this project. How do we tell stories? How do we tell stories? How do we take the materials that we have that are reflective of somebody's life and place them into a context that's more appealing, that's more open, that could be more impactful or emotional in the lives of those who interact with it? The classic narrative paradigm, we talked about this with the students who are helping us to, in fact, take the materials, digitize them, put them into the Omega site, write a compelling plot, interesting characters, a chronology, the movements of these characters, personal connections, and visual enhancements of the story. We began thinking about with students, well, and again, we were all a part of creating this exhibit online. It wasn't as if I was telling students what to do. It wasn't as if Rachel was saying, Here's this person's story. It's been written in a text. Take it with these materials and put it into a digital repository. The digital repository, in fact, became the original story that was told about this person. So we thought about, well, how do we use photographs and visual elements to shed light on a tragic, emotionally complex event in a uniquely personal way? We put together uh, three different elements that were related to the exhibit for the online portion of the physical exhibit at the museum. First was an archive. So what we did was we collected all of the various drawings that Hetty had left behind, which were in fact, in many ways, the only evidence that she had even lived into this archive, and trying to use them as a way to imagine ourselves into her experience with very, very little con context in which to do that. We put together a story map that in fact became not the story of Hetty's life, which nobody knew anymore. 
but the story of the creation of this project, which was in some ways the only evidence that we had to celebrate the life of somebody. And that became part of the exhibit. So we asked students in thinking about, well, what is a story going to be? How are we going to break it apart into its specific pieces in order that you can help us create it, that you can help us to share it with others? And the five, <laughs> the five elements that we came up with the students, and it was remarkable, uh, and it's still inspiring to think about this through the lens of digital humanities work. What does it mean to remember Hedy Stranod, the dressmaker, the person? And how does our digital exhibit help facilitate that process of memory work? So these are the questions that we asked students. And they said, well, she was a dressmaker. This is what we know about her. This is how we can begin to take her story and reassemble it. Right? And the metaphors that we started to use to talk about her story and dressmaking were just all together inspiring and keeping them in close context. So finding remnants. This is part of the story of finding out about Hetty, but also her story. Finding remnants, which were the images themselves of the dresses, stitching the pieces back together through, you know, should, this should be a movie, like the detective work that we went through to find out about who she was, where she was from. Very, it was very uh, wonderfully circumstantial. It would be a terrible realistic story because it was all miraculous, the things that we discovered along the way. Looking for patterns, bringing these designs to life, and then imagining who she may have been. As we were putting that online exhibit together, which we'll look at in a little while, uh, we also knew that the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee was going to take this exhibit on the road as a traveling exhibit. So what we wanted to do is use the digital exhibit as a way to continue to find evidence of this person, of her experience, where she was from, dressmaking, this relationship to individuals either escaping from the Holocaust or not. So we put together a mobile app for this exhibit so that when the story and the exhibit go on the road, uh, others may be able to look at these designs, right? That we initially thought, okay, these designs are going to be, you know, just the images themselves. It should be easy enough to do. We'll put some QR codes next to them so folks can leave their comments, talk about what they know about this person or what they know about dressmaking and the period of history in which these designs were put together. And taking a picture of those designs, upload the images to a database. So we were thinking about kind of crowdsourcing in a way and trying to find out more. We were still convinced that we could find out more. So our repository, in that sense, became much more open. And this is an, ex this is an image from an Omeka archive. Right? These are, this is what we had, essentially, a few more pieces. Right? We had three pages, but this is all we had. These items for students in the class, right, these, they helped us to digitize these images, put them into Omeka, use metadata to identify the images. Right? These are students in a, you know, a Jewish culture class, and they're learning about metadata. It was a very fascinating process. But it was something that was at stake. Right? Like we want to know, we wanted to identify what these images are. It wasn't a dry process. There was a lot of debate about how we would identify the importance of, of these images. And at the end of the day, this is something I've just discovered actually uh, last year, all of the work that you see here is going back into a repository, a content repository in the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. So students, the work that they're doing in the classroom to identify and, and process, it was very insecure in many ways, like what, what are we doing? It's like, aren't we just classifying, there's just something for a class project. Said, no, this is going into the repository, the content repository of the museum. And we wanted that to happen. We wanted to break down some of these barriers using the digital platforms that we had available to us for free uh, to establish a connection between students doing the work of humanistic inquiry where, uh, for which there were no answers <laughs> and going into a cultural institution's repository. The class began to take on, this is an amazing class as you can probably tell, Preserving and telling you know, libraries, museums, and their responsibility for vulnerable stories. We started to think of it along those lines. What do we mean by that? Stories that don't have codified beginning and ends, that don't have a, a narrative to which we all agree or even know everything about. We continued to build out what we wanted this exhibit to do. Uh, and we felt that we could use a story map. So one of the elements that, you, that I had back here, um, the story map. What we had available to us was our story of discovery, which was going to become the story of Hedy Stranod, the only story. Uh, 
we wanted to organize these elements not so much in a narrative that we could represent textually, but spatially. So the idea that these characters existed in particular moments in history, but in particular regions of the world, we felt that we were going to use a story map as a learning tool so that students could more clearly organize their thoughts around the artifacts that we had discovered. We asked students, well, how do you tell a story? How do you break down a story into its component parts? So we started off with Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> we said, yeah, this is an interesting way to tell the story, right? Uh, think of it as formalistic or a structuralist, right? It's like, what are, the, what are the consistent elements of a story? But then when we asked students to think about something a little bit more complex, how do we tell a story that's much more broad? How do we decide who the actors are? You know, if we read Little Red Riding Hood, we can identify components of it. How can you as students identify components from a story like this? And we felt this was the way to do that through this work. They left behind, in a way, the narrative and thought spatially, well, how can we do this in the story map? The next remarkable stage of this journey, uh, somebody in our class was also volunteering at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. I still can't believe it when I talk about it. So this person uh, was a part of a production of the previous season at the Milwaukee Rep of The Diary of Anne Frank. They still had, from this production, materials that were reconstructed specifically for the stage show that were, you know, uh, bolts of cloth, things like that, that were meant to be and were created such that they were from that period of history. So she said, I'm going to go talk to some of the seamstresses at the Milwaukee Rep. Maybe they can help us do something with this story. Maybe they can help us make it further and in more interesting to a broader audience. We said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sure. What are you going to do? Uh, the rep volunteered to make these dresses for the first time. And I'm going to show you how that happened. They were always laughing. The whole Strinath family was a very happy family. I was there not as, as a child. I went, was taken to Prague from my uncle, and from Prague I went to Ausik. Auntie Hedwig had this uh, sort of uh, a big room where there were sewing machines, and, and she sewed dresses. And I know when she came to, to Ega to visit us, she always brought us some nice dresses that we could wear. Uncle uh, Paul with with his wife Hedwig, they were all in one uh, lorry taken to. They were taken first to to Theresienstadt and from there straight away to to Auschwitz. Yes. Okay. And he was a very jolly person, my uncle. And he was. Uh, Somebody told us he was still making jokes in the in the lorry when they were being taken away. That didn't help him to survive. It's very moving to me uh, to be a part of this project. So 
the designers were already familiar with how to make dresses from the historical period. They volunteered their time, the rep volunteered the materials and the time of the, of the seamstresses and the dressmakers. And these designs that you saw in the, in the short video, which was made by a volunteer in the New Media Studies Film Department at UWM, just said, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, that went into the website, the film, uh, and these designs were then put on display at the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee uh, as a way to talk about how we would reimagine history. Right? This, the, these dresses were never made. We felt that they had the potential to draw more people into this story. When the dresses were made, uh, and again, you can't make this stuff up, right? It was all just a series of circumstances. The TAP uh, section of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel Online did a little story about it, highlighting the recreation of these dresses, which became the centerpiece of the exhibit. And the story of Hedwig Stranod became much more interesting to the Milwaukee, in the Milwaukee area. And we can see here there are links now to the digital exhibit that students were working on in the classroom. And we were helping them to, dis to go through the process of constructing an exhibit that suddenly had a much broader audience. And the comments to this page became very interesting too in terms of what people knew about the period, how they wished to participate, and offer their voices in this story. Then, another funny thing happened. <laughs> Somebody at the university uh, saw this happening in our public relations department, and they had a contact at the New York Times. So now this story becomes even larger. And from this page in the New York Times, there is a link back to the exhibit at the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee, and there's also a link from that exhibit back to our digital archive that we created online with students. That now is findable, searchable, and commentable from folks who are reading the New York Times to our students who at the very beginning of this process, as you recall, we just had a few letters and interest from a local museum. So in doing that, we continued to build out our digital exhibit, our story map of this project. And this was something that we designed after the New York Times story. We just said, well, we needed to have something that's going to help bring together our story, not simply of Hedy Stranod, but our discovery of the materials, where they were, what they linked to, the artifacts that were displayed, helping to find out through Yav Hashem about her story. And then the intern, our wonderful, our wonderful intern, who knew German, right? Which led to all of this wonderful work in terms of bringing to light a story that didn't necessarily even exist before we began. So we were creating the history of this individual when none existed. So in animating the past, as we began to you know, conclude our class and continue to talk to students and others in the local area, we, we felt that the digital humanities project that we had put together wasn't so much one where we were encouraging students and ourselves to be authors of somebody's story, but as editors of a story, of stitching together something that didn't exist in a whole cloth from the very beginning. So we wanted to create this short film as a way to represent, you know, Hetty's life and its impact on us. So we talked a lot about students, like, well, what do we see in this image here? How is it different here? What, you know, how do we begin to focus in on elements of an image and of a story in order, and such that it tells the story differently? So students were talking about, like, oh, yeah, we should have this kind of angle in the film that Alan's making, Alan Daigle, who's the marvelous director of the film that we had here uh, because it highlights this element of her story. So students, again, were becoming fascinated with, well, if we talk about this in this way, in this order, we can talk about how it fits within a broader cultural history related to the Holocaust. We started talking about editing as a mode of authoring, only fixing something if the shots are broken. Only arrangement, if you believe the story already exists before we've made it, well, we were making the story. So there was a lot more at stake in representing what was happening. So in that sense, the work of editing for us and our students had a lot in common with history and archival research. Students traditionally in a class where we're talking about elements of the past, think of it as visiting an archive or a museum. You know, these are things that are already cataloged, classified, interpreted, full of meaning that's not my own. But students, and thinking about employing Omeka, very easy to use tool. 
right? The circulation of our history and the meaning of that history became very palpable to them through this process. In the contemporary future, the technical gap between citizen and editor is collapsing in many ways by the availability of these tools. And that's a gap that's collapsing in our, potentially could collapse in our classroom more and more, right? As students act in this, these kind of different roles. So creating a living history from materials imagined to be dead, past. So for us, the digital world in our class, and we think beyond that, helps us to share the responsibility for the creation of somebody's story, the actual creation of somebody's story. Uh, preserving her vision as an artist inspired us to think differently about how we preserve identities in a rich and meaningful way. And the repository let us assign information to each artifact, right? Allowing us to continue to allow that archive to grow with new information coming to us. So it wasn't we were, as if we were building a digital archive that was a, analogous to something that existed in a physical space. We were building something that could not be built any other way and from which new narratives could emerge. So it's a way of, in many ways, when we think about the original artifacts, the dress designs, the letters, the envelopes, the stamps, everything about them, how that translated into the recreation or the, the recasting or the actual production of this work, the way that others in classes across campus began to reimagine these images from different periods of history or from different artists. So colleagues in the Peck School of the Arts started to look at our materials and started to design responses to assignments in their classes where it wasn't so much somebody from Czechoslovakia, but somebody from South Africa. And these are, we're hoping, continue to inspire others who see this. So for us, at the end of the day, this project, this remarkable project that continues to exist and grow, uh, made us think about public digital history, three words put together, what's the relationship of them in some ways, right? And, uh, as related to post-memory, right? How can or ought a project like this be seen as contributing to our understanding of the Holocaust? In what way does digital humanist work relate to the work of humanistic inquiry and its possibility, its fraught possibility in the wake of the Holocaust in terms of critical theory and its discussion in that sense? And does the physical museum exhibit and its attendant digital extension prove hospitable, hospitable to the kind of work and maintaining of interge intergenerational dialogue? And so this project became the centerpiece of a graduate seminar, thinking about the Holocaust, where post-memory, Marion Hirsch, her work, and others in a more theoretically informed sense, were starting to talk about what's the relationship between these two images, right? What's the authentic existence of these images in terms of their relationship to each other? So, it was fascinating to tell our undergraduate students, well, you just created material for a graduate class. <laughs> Where we're talking about somebody named uh, Levinas, you know, and uh, I said, who? <laughs> we're just helping you, you know, make dresses. So it was a fascinating process that, in my way of thinking, uh, is incredibly full of potential for how we might imagine digital humanities work contributing to intercultural understanding, uh, the definition, and the continued existence of history as a shared object of creation for people who feel like they have nothing to contribute to history, perhaps, through the lens of storytelling and uh, the, the, the wonderfully rich kind of metaphoric relationship between dressmaking and history for us uh, was remarkable. So this is the story I talk about today. It's, it's, uh, it's something I'm still getting my hands around in terms of what it means to me, but it's, uh, it was wonderful to see students in the classroom you know, take to something like this. And it's something that if we look at this work right now in its aftermath, it seems intuitive that it would. And I would say, you know, in, in closing today, that there are stories like this out there, that if we embrace digital humanities and its potential for democratic authorship and in investigation into the humanities, it may not save the humanities, but it can certainly contribute to it, its continued vitality for our students and for us. So thank you. <laughs>